prayer and a reading from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He destined us in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. For he has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. In him, according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all good things, according to the counsel of his will, we who first hoped in Christ have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. Almighty God, as we come before you this evening, fill our minds with your truth and our hearts with your love. Help us to know you, help us to love you, Help us to be inspired by the witness of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, by her intercession, by the teaching and intercession of St. Thomas Aquinas. We ask all this in the words your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, pray for us. Very good. Well, thanks for coming out tonight. Happy to share with you one of my favorite topics, really talking about the indwelling of the Holy Trinity. I think, unfortunately, there's a temptation for us as Catholics. When we hear the word Trinity, we, we suddenly start feel like we're, we're walking on eggshells, you know. I don't want to say anything wrong. I don't want to think too hard. Um, it's going to end up, it's going to end up either with me confused or saying something heretical. Um, unfortunately, I think that's the way that we feel sometimes when talking about the doctrine of the Trinity. But in fact, as we know deep down, and I think as St. Elizabeth of the Trinity gives us a particular witness, there's no greater source of truth and goodness that we can come to than the Blessed Trinity. There's no greater fruit for contemplation than that which is to be found in contemplating God himself, uh, in himself, in his inner life. Um, I like to present not only on St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, but on the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas, because I think um, they inform one another. And frankly, I think that St. Elizabeth is a tremendous help in applying the doctrine of divine indwelling in our lives and making it real for us, of making it a kind of spiritual practice of ours, a kind of spirituality that we can have to be always in some way or another directed back to the truth that God dwells within us by His grace. Um, and so I'll go ahead and put, um, put some concepts on the board um, that are familiar to us, but maybe you've never quite seen them all in one place. And I'm running a certain risk tonight of trying to put them all in one place. <laughs> um, I'm, at, at the danger of saying too much, I'm going to try to show you how everything is connected. Um, so, we've probably heard the expression, children of God, that we are children, if I can spell, children of God. I know you've also heard the expression of faith, hope, and charity. In fact, we were just learning about an RCIA, that's what I just erased on the board. Faith, hope, and charity, the theological virtues. And I'm sure you've also heard of grace, God's grace, 
especially sanctifying grace. Usually what we mean of when we're talking about being in a state of grace. And I'm sure that you've also heard, at least in the scriptures, that we are temples of God. Or at least you've heard temples of the Holy Spirit. Temples of God, temples um, the Holy Spirit. And the other, the last concept I want to put on the board is that we are made partakers in the divine nature so that we have um, participation. I'm just going to put the word participation up. In the divine nature. Okay. I think that if you cultivate a, you might say, awareness of the presence of God in us, all of these things come together, um, and we see them really as, as different sides of the same coin, different facets of the same diamond. So I want to kind of connect all of these ideas to the indwelling of the Trinity. And I put them up on the board like this because I'm literally going to point back um, as, as we go along to show you how these ideas connect. Um, for me, part of the reason I'm passionate about sharing this topic, why it's one of my favorites, is because this is a kind of vision that only really clicked for me, um, not even in seminary, but after seminary and really beginning to preach and seeing this theme return again and again and having to reflect, having to go back, having to go back even to some of my first courses at Dominican House, to the course on the Trinity, to the book we read in that class, um, to seeing how all of these ideas are connected, and they're, they're never far away from us when we pick up the scriptures. Um, we, if, we're, if we have eyes to see them, we'll run into this everywhere. Uh, we'll run into it in the language of the liturgy, too. Um, I can't tell you how many times as a priest I can pick out this word participation mentioned in the, the presidential prayers of the Mass, for instance. Um, the prayer over the gifts, you know, when I say pray, brothers and sisters, my sacrifice and yours, that prayer. But also at the end of, at the, end of the Mass, um, that's just one example of how these themes come up so frequently. But I want to take uh, tonight to, to connect all of these in light of really the life of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, because this was really kind of the foundation of her life. Her great mission was to hand on these insights um, to souls, um, first of all by contemplating it herself, but also as we know through her writings. And now with her beatification and recent canonization, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity has become um, a kind of official sort of teacher of this doctrine for us. Her her role in showing us this has been um, all the more elevated by her canonization. Um, okay, so that's all by way of introduction. I do want to just give some brief sort of biographical points on St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. Some of you may, in fact, it sounds like know more about St. Elizabeth of the Trinity than I do, um, but I just want to talk a little bit about um, her. She, she was, you know, lived in the second kind of half of the 1800s there in France was a Carmelite nun, eventually entered the Carmelite nuns in Dijon, France. We think of mustard, of course. Um, but her father was a soldier and uh, died while she was a young girl. Um, you know, I think her upbringing might make us think of, of St. Therese. Um, and certainly there are moments in her childhood where, for instance, she was conquering her willfulness and her neediness uh, that are like St. Therese's own conversion, you might say, in her early years. But some particular moments stand out when St. Elizabeth received Holy Communion for the first time. Well, first of all, there's her first confession. People, people in her family or who knew her rec recognized that actually her first confession had an effect in her life. She was actually able to begin to, to govern, you know, her kind of temperamental um, disposition, you know, um, she, the grace of the sacrament actually helped her 
even before, you know, 16 months later when she received Holy Communion for the first time, um, which is a prelude to everything else. Having the Lord present in her in Holy Communion provided that tremendous experience and foundation for her of what would become her life's work of contemplating God dwelling in her. Her name, in fact, Elizabeth, um, we know in Hebrew means house of God. Um, so she, she took this as meaningful for her as a kind of divine sign and blessing that, in fact, um, she is a dwelling place of God. Um, and, you know, I think she points us to this reality that we all share as Christians, but she possessed it in a special way. It was her, really her charism to take hold of this part of the faith and to make it the center of her spirituality, the fact that God dwells in us. One of the most significant turning points in her life was when she came across a Dominican friar uh, who came to the Carmel, actually, her monastery, and you could say this gave her life a decisive orientation, just one conversation, this providential meeting. And I'll go ahead and read the passage from this book, which is a book by a Dominican friar, a French Dominican friar, about St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. I think this is an excellent book for uh, Father Philippon, The Spiritual Doctrine of Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity, written, of course, long before she was beatified or canonized. So she's just called Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity. Um, this is a very good book. I, I, sh- I want to recommend Father Philippon. I guess it's not on the cover. M.M. Um, M. Philippon. But he, I'll just go ahead and read this passage. When Elizabeth timidly questioned the distinguished religious, the Dominican, as to the meaning of the movements of grace, of which she had been aware for some time, the fact that she had this sense that God dwelt in her, that, that someone was, was dwelling within her by grace, Uh, Father Villet replied in forceful, thought-provoking language that characterized him. But most certainly, my child, the Father is there, the Son is there, and the Holy Ghost is there. And like the contemplative theologian he was, he proceeded to explain further how by the grace of baptism the soul becomes that living temple of which St. Paul speaks, and how together with the Holy Ghost the whole Trinity is present with its creative and sanctifying power making its dwelling in us, coming to abide in the most secret recesses of the soul, there to receive in an atmosphere of faith and charity the interior worship of praise and adoration that is its due. St. Elizabeth was delighted by this dogmatic explanation, since it was grace that was urging her she could, in perfect security, yield to her interior attraction and dwell in the innermost depths of her soul. During this interview, she was overcome by an irresistible movement of recollection. The priest went on talking, but he soon saw that Elizabeth Cates was no longer listening. Quote, I was longing for him to be silent, quote, she later said to the prioress. So maybe you can relate to this same experience of hearing Dominicans talking, saying, that's great, and it would be great if he was also silent now, so I could think about it. Um, (laughs) <laughs> I thought that uh, you might be able to relate to that, uh, especially as St. Patrick's parishioners. So, of course, uh, you know, it's, it's worth having full disclosure. Carmelite spirituality really is the best spirituality yes. <laughs> when explained by Dominican friars. <laughs> I didn't come up with that line. Um, it's a Dominican you would know, whose name you would know. Um, I'm sure a lot of Dominicans agree with that principle, actually. Um, But there is a kind of tradition to this, uh, even going back to St. Teresa of Avila, who benefited from Dominican spiritual directors, um, uh, who said it was more important to have a learned spiritual director than a holy spiritual director. I'm not sure what that says about the Dominican friars, but um, nonetheless, that was her principle, um, (laughs) <laughs> to have a learned spiritual director than a holy one. Um, so that's an interesting principle to, to run with. So there's a tradition that St. That Elizabeth is a part of um, between the Carmelites and the Dominicans. So I offer that by way of introduction, just to know that um, 
St. Elizabeth made this the kind of centerpiece of her spiritual life, and I think she's a good guide for how we can take what, at first blush, might appear to be a very heady theological doctrine, as this Dominican kind of launched right into, and you might have heard me in saying those, in, in reading that passage, skipping the stones of the things I've already written on the board. Um, St. Elizabeth shows us that we can take hold and contemplate this great truth of our faith, uh, and I think, you know, uh, especially being familiar with her prayer, um, her very long prayer to the Trinity, uh, is a good way to apply this doctrine in our spiritual lives. It's a good way to, to become more and more aware of God's presence in us. Um, you know, St. Faustina has the Divine Mercy Chaplet. Uh, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity has this prayer. Um, Okay, so I do now want to sort of launch into uh, the, the Thomistic doctrine here, a Thomistic explanation of the indwelling of the Trinity. We need to, we need to begin really with talking about grace, right? Um, a word you're familiar with, having heard in the church here, having heard in talks here, grace. We give that catechism definition of grace so often, you know, what is grace? Well, to share in God's life. It's a participation in God's life. Unfortunately, I think we stop there, you know. If we were curious children, the follow-up question will be, and what exactly is God's life? What is God's life? We should be able to answer that more, right? In other words, what does Jesus reveal to us of the inner life of God? The inner life of God. Well, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is there, the Son is there, the Holy Spirit is there. All God, all eternal, all a communion of love from the beginning, from eternity, in fact. So when we have God's grace, when we have his sanctifying grace in particular, we have God's life, even his Trinitarian life, to some extent, to a profound extent. We participate. That word participate is one I'm very passionate about. Um, the way to understand participation from, you know, Plato all the way through, from the, from the philosophers all the way through the theologians up to now, the way to understand participation is just that to participate in something is to have a share in what something else has the fullness of. So, um, to have a share in what something else has the fullness of. So, to participate in God's life is to have a share in that fullness of life that he has. To become, as St. Peter says, partakers of the divine nature so that what God has all of, we can receive some of. Where is that? Um, I think it's chapter 2. I forget. So, we need to talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit a little bit. We need to think about and contemplate the mystery that... The Son proceeds from the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from them both, the Father and the Son. And thinking about this mystery, you know, thinking about it, here is light beyond light, always knowing and loving, being known and being loved. We have the eternal processions of the Trinity. And here is where I'm going to draw, again, um, something... (laughs) Uh, something I'm al- always drawing for the RCIA class, that the best way to conceive of the processions of the Trinity are like this. Not with just a simple triangle, but by pointing out the arrows, which show us, symbolize the eternal processions, something that's just always been, that is the most fundamental hinges of reality, that the Son always proceeds from the Father, and that the Holy Spirit always proceeds from the Father and the Son as a, as a perfectly united principle. They breathe forth the Holy Spirit, uh, the mutual bond of their love. Um, you know, we often struggle hearing those words, Father and Son, and thinking immediately of a human Father and Son. And people, you know, will say, well, you're not actually saying that they're like persons, right? Or, you know, that this is a Father and a Son. And that's where we have to stop ourselves and say, no, 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 we're the image. This is the reality, the the highest reality. This is where all fatherhood in heaven and on earth comes down from. This is where all sonship in heaven and on earth comes down from. This is where all personhood is is rooted 
in the divine persons themselves, distinct from themselves, subsisting relations, if we want to start using um, some good uh, language, St. Thomas would be proud of us, subsisting relations. So that um, among the persons of the Trinity, because of these processions, there is also relation, um, relationality. I don't want to go any deeper than that at the moment, but it's just important for us to know that uh, who God is really is the basis for what he does, right? And when we see him doing things, when we see him at work in our salvation, when we see him at work in creation, I'll have to hold questions till the end just so I can get through it. Um, When we see God at work, he's also constantly revealing something of who he is in a way he can't help but do so. Um, So really everything in our spiritual life comes back. (laughs) It's wild. It sounds like I'm exaggerating. Everything in our spiritual life comes back to this, to the Son proceeding from the Father, to the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. Right? Um, okay. They're the reasons God does anything, and the reasons He acts the way He does outside of Himself. Uh, creation itself uh, is rooted in this eternal communion of love. And even in a way, our own human nature, right? Anyone, regardless of whether they've heard anything or believed anything about God, has a mind and a heart. Any human being has a mind and a heart. So that within any human being, here we are. This is how I represent human nature in RCIA. Uh, We are the classic stick figure. But if we were to to, to be able to do a close-up, a spiritual close-up, and see what's inside of that human being, there would be similarly a movement of knowing and of loving, right? This twofold interior movement. We can know things in a way that animals can't. We can know abstract things and concepts. And we can love and desire in a way that animals can't, you know. Um, We don't just desire that our appetites be satisfied. We can desire um, fundamentally, most importantly, God himself. So there's that basic natural image of God in us. And what we're going to talk about, what all of these words are, is pointing out how the life of God itself is shared with us, um, how the life of the Son comes into us, how the life of the Holy Spirit comes into us, how by their presence the Father is also present. Um, Okay. So think of how in creation God has been made, uh, or in salvation God has been made known to us. Um, You know, I mean, even think about it from God's perspective for a moment, right? Here you're an eternal being and you have to speak to creatures that are ticking clocks, you know, that um, have to, to hear language expressed over the course of at least a few seconds to be able to hear, to listen, to to remember. So how does the eternal word of God speak to us? Well, that's just it. God speaks to us through his eternal word made flesh. Um, A story I like to tell is of uh, a friend of mine who was teaching Bible school, and they asked the kids, um, well, why is Jesus called the word? Why is Jesus called the word? And one kid blurts out, because he's all that God wants to say to us, (laughs) which is, is like, absolutely true, you know, just perfect. In fact, that kid was quoting John on the cross, little did he know, to go back to the Carmelites. Um, In that one single eternal word, Christ himself, God has spoken all that he wants to say to us, and in a way, all that he has to say to us, all that he can say to us. Um, So, the one who is always the Father's Son from eternity became the Son of Mary in time, as we know, as we pray, as we live in the mystery of the incarnation. So God shows us, comes to save us, but also shows us something of what he has always been. He's always the son. He's always been the son. But by becoming the son of Mary, he shows us something about who he is in himself. Um, He shows us something about the father too. Uh, And in showing us also initiates grafting us into that same reality. 
doesn't just, you know, when God, when God shows, he's saving. When he's saving, he's also showing, demonstrating. Okay, how do we learn about the Holy Spirit? Well, um, the Spirit actually is mentioned a lot in the Old Testament, so we have some little foreshadowings. But also, uh, we know that Jesus himself uh, prophesied the sending of the Holy Spirit. I mean, he, he promised the sending of the Holy Spirit. And that came in the, in the most glorious moment on Pentecost with the descent of the tongues of fire. Um, but also there's other, you might say, uh, places that we can visibly see the Holy Spirit at work. We, of course, know at the baptism, the dove that descends uh, upon the action happening, or the cloud at the transfiguration, or one I think that, that might surprise you the most, the very breath of the Lord Jesus himself, when at the resurrection, after the resurrection, he appears to the apostles and really institutes confession. What does it say? But he breathes on them. It says, receive the Holy Spirit. Those whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. Those whose sins you retain are retained. And of course, to this day, as we know, as we hear in confession, in the formula of absolution, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are mentioned. Um, so it's important to connect the, the forgiveness of sins back there to the Holy Spirit. Okay, so those are the things that we see happening. Um, but again, they refer us back to the inner life of God. They refer us back to God who is gift and love. The, the Holy Spirit who is gift and love. If we're going to use other names um, for the Son and the Holy Spirit, these are them. The Son is the Word of the Father and the image of the Father. The Holy Spirit is gift with a capital G. He's the thing that can be given. He's, he's givable God, right? He's love with a capital L. Um, so it's important we know those other words for the divine persons because they reveal something. Uh, and the, the moments in the scriptures I just mentioned, the moments in history I just mentioned of Christ coming, of the Holy Spirit descending. Those are visible signs, um, but are meant to bring us and incorporate us into the invisible reality. So, okay. Think about it this way, that God is so good, he, he doesn't just want us to know about him in general, but he wants us to know about his inner life, something we could never know on our own. So he reveals it. Um, you know, there's another point here, that, and that's that knowing and loving are connected. The more we know, the more we love. And God himself is the ultimate reality of knowledge and love. And to know about him is to be introduced into loving him. So, revelation in Jesus is never just a matter of information, but also of participation. Um, so, I'm kind of saying the same thing in different words, but to know God in the full sense is to be invited into his inner life. Uh, so this is when we then talk about grace and that sharing in that inner life of God. God's not content with us just knowing him from the outside um, and knowing us from the outside. You might say that God, because he's our creator, holds us in being. And so he has a deep destiny for us that's to reproduce even his inner life within us um, to make images of himself, to share his personal life, to share with us um, the distinctiveness of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, to give us the family resemblance of the children of God. Um, so God dwells in us. And uh, this is really where we're brought to appreciate what we call the the invisible missions, if we're going to use the, the, the theological language. All the things I just mentioned, the tongues of fire, the cloud, even Christ coming among us as a man, these are visible missions. The invisible missions, that's the sending of the Son and the Holy Spirit into our minds and hearts. The sending of the Son and to the Holy Spirit into our minds and hearts. And this happens um, really through faith, hope, and charity. Um, the sending of the Son, the word of wisdom into our minds. I, I think uh, this is something we, we don't appreciate enough. I think a lot of Catholics would be comfortable telling you, well, the Holy Spirit dwells in me. But, you know, when it comes down to it, 
it might give us pause to talk about, well, does Jesus dwell in you? Does the Son dwell in you? And they say, well, yes, when I receive him in Holy Communion. Okay, but what about at other times? If you're living the Christian life, if you're living the life of grace, does Jesus dwell in you constantly, um, uh, habitually? And the answer is yes. Uh, And it's especially we see in our ability to know, our minds, our intellects, that God can take up residence, that God the Son, the Word, the the thing that's spoken by the Father, all that he has to say, that can take up residence in our minds. It does. This is what it means for the Lord to sanctify us. Um, so we have faith. You might say, okay, up to this has been a pagan um, stick figure so far. But we're going to baptize him. That's the grace of baptism. Um, I'll draw a little shell here. Uh, we just baptized him. What's the difference? Um, well, the Son takes up residence in his mind as the word of wisdom, as he comes to believe in God and make acts of faith, uh, to have faith as a stable habit. And then, how does the Holy Spirit uh, come to dwell? He comes to dwell. Um, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell. I'm kind of um, free-flowing on these images. Uh, so... I come up with the best images live, I guess, uh, I think. So, the spirit of love is in us, especially through charity. This I've drawn is our will. I know that's very uh, confusing, but just think of it this way. Our hearts, our our will, our capacity to choose, that that faculty, that um, power that we have is, is... Elevated by God's grace, by the presence of the Holy Spirit, by receiving charity, God's love, the very love with which God loves in eternity, in himself. By receiving charity, um, we're given that ability in our wills to love God above all things and our neighbor as, as, our, as ourself, our neighbor really as God loves them. Um, we're, we're raised up, we're divinized through this. Now, we can't forget about hope, too. Hope is, is a little bit more hidden, but it's also something in our wills. Uh, I'll tell you a story of a um, young woman I met last year at Yale. And uh, I, I mentioned Yale just so you know that Yale students can be puzzled by a theological puzzle like this. A uh, Yale undergrad could be. And she said, well, how do I know when I'm loving God? Because he's God and I should love him. And... I'm loving God just because he makes me happy and I want to be happy with him in heaven. <laughs> and little as you know, that's a very clear articulation of charity and hope. You know, Loving God because he's God. Charity. Loving God above all things because he's God. Loving God because we want to be happy with him in heaven. That's hope. Um, it's not selfish to love God because he's good for us. <laughs> it's not selfish to want to be happy with God in heaven. In fact, it's not something we can even do on our own. So if we're really doing it, it's a sign God is at work in us. You, know? you might say, well, everyone wants to go to heaven, Father. No one wants to go to hell. It's like, okay. But to actually desire heaven for what it is, that takes grace. Now, we receive grace. We know we receive grace through the sacraments. Um, so God has already kind of like come up with the solutions to the problems and is working them in our lives. <laughs> the purpose of talks like these is really to lead us to appreciate what God is doing to appreciate what God is doing and to invite him to do it more, invite him into our lives, uh, dwelling more deeply within us. Okay, there's a temptation, I think, to think of these great and wonderful things as, as metaphor or just kind of poetry, as exaggeration. And I have to tell you, until I had a full theological, I won't even say course, I have to say, you know, it was the whole of my STB, MDiv, then doing some philosophy, and then preaching for a few years that this all clicked um, to be able to appreciate this, to begin to appreciate this. So, um, I, and I say that not just to like tell you how much education Dominicans get, but to say that this is something that we see and we're familiar with, and we're swimming in these words very often, especially in the liturgy and the scriptures, but... Uh, to see how it's all connected, it, it takes a while for us to, to, to see that this is real. 
And this isn't exaggeration. This isn't poetry. Here's, what, here's sort of what I mean, and I'm, I have a handout for you, which also includes St. Elizabeth's Prayer, so you have that to take home. Um, and then, could you pass these out, actually? Thanks. Um, actually, I need one. <laughs> I always give my hands out. <laughs> All right. So the quote I have for you, it's dangerous to put a summa quote, you know, just straight, no ice um, there. Um, but I've underlined the important part. Here's, here's how we might object, you know. When you say, well, Father, okay, it's not that surprising that God's in us because God's everywhere. So, of course, he's in us, too. Um, well, yes, God's everywhere. He's all present by, we call it essence, presence, and power. Um, God, you know, all things are, are laid bare to him. He holds all things in being. And he's innermost in all things. Um, you know, St. Thomas says it belongs to God not only to be in things, but to be in them innermostly. <laughs> so I like that line. God is innermost in all things. It's, you know, it seems like an exaggeration when St. Augustine says he's closer to us than we are to ourselves. That seems like we're exaggerating. But actually, it's just flat out true at the deepest philosophical level, the deepest theological level. God's present to us. God is closer to us than we are to ourselves because he holds us in being. Okay, yes, God's present. But here's how it's different when he dwells in us by grace. Um, So God is in all things by essence, presence, and power. I have this quote here. Above this common mode, however, here's the underline, there is one special mode belonging to the rational nature a.k.a. us human beings and our angel friends, wherein God is said to be present as the object known is in the knower and the beloved is in the lover. The known is in the knower and the beloved is in the lover. Think about that up, back up here in the graph, in the, in the chart here. We see that line represents just the fact that we can know things. And this other kind of weird double arrow, that's just the fact that we can love things, Right? But for God to take occupancy, to take up residence in our souls, he's there present as what is known. He's present as what we love. He makes himself present. Okay, just after the underline. And since the rational creature, by its operation of knowledge and love, attains to God himself, a.k.a. we can get to heaven, we can know God in this life and get to heaven, Um, So in that big quote that's underlined, and then just after the underlined part, and since the rational nature by its operation of knowledge and love attains to God himself. You don't this doesn't have to make sense, um, so don't worry. According to this special mode, God is said not only to exist in the rational creature, but also to dwell therein as in his own temple. So God's not just present. He doesn't just exist in us. He dwells in us. And he dwells in us according to his own proper way of life and being. He dwells in us as the Son, as the Word. He dwells in us as the Holy Spirit, as love, as gift. Um, and this is powerful, right? And this, is, this is all it took for St. Elizabeth. In fact, she would, have, she would have glossed over long ago, right? Uh, she did with Father Valet. Um, it's enough. She knew it intuitively, um, by grace. She, she knew this by a, a special prompting the Holy Spirit. Uh, it became clear to her, uncontroversial for her. Okay, that word temple is significant because the only thing that dwells in a temple, that lives in a temple, is God, right? And we know that God uh, uses that language. Think of how much, not only just the centrality of the temple for Israel, but how the word temple is used throughout. Um, and throughout the scriptures, think of Revelation, God dwelling with men. Um, so we need to, the scriptures give us not only that, that transcendent, beautiful image of a temple. Think of like a Gothic cathedral, you know, uh, with uh, the Blessed Sacrament present in it. You know, that's God dwelling in, a, in the best temples, best kind of temple we could make for him. I'm a big fan of the Gothic, just saying. Um, But also, there's a more cozy image given to us. And this is the language of the Lord 
at the end of the Gospel of John, that God dwells in us as in a home, you know, and that he's preparing a mansion for us in heaven. What does really that mean? Well, he's preparing us for heaven, and he's, in fact, already dwelling with us here and now. He dwells with us here and now so that we can dwell with him. That's where you might ask, okay, but wait, is God dwelling in me or am I dwelling in God? And the answer is yes. (laughs) Um, Like when they asked... um, when they asked uh, Father Hesburgh of Notre Dame uh, whether the, the alma mater of the school, Notre Dame Our Mother, was about the Blessed Virgin Mary or about the school. And he said, yes. <laughs> so here we have the answer. Yes, God dwells in us and we dwell in God. Um, and this is really the way he affects it in us, brings it about in us. Um, and here's where I want to tie it back to what you already know. This is really, you know, the same reality as what we talk about in being in the state of grace. You know, we often use that phrase, the state of grace. And you might ask someone, well, what's it, what, is it, what is the state of grace? And they might say, well, it's when you're not in the state of mortal sin. It's like, okay, true. But it's a whole lot better than just not being in sin and not being in the state of sin. It's having the presence of God within us through all of these gifts. Uh, it's being a temple of, of God, having the temple dwell Uh, having the Lord dwell within us as in a temple. And it's really this reality of faith, hope, and charity that we live. That's why those come up so often. You know, one of the oldest passages in the New Testament, um, St. Paul's letters to the Thessalonians, the very first lines, Paul giving thanks for the faith, hope, and charity present in that church there. Um, So here we have it from the very beginning, faith, hope, and charity mentioned mentioned as a group, as a set. What are faith, hope, and charity? Well, they're God making us like himself. Um, They're God directing us to himself. And we know, of course, the greatest of these, St. Paul says, we even had the Corinthians passage a a little while ago on Sunday, on one of the Sundays. The greatest of these is charity, right? Because it's what lasts even through heaven, right? Even into heaven. Faith and hope are for the journey. They, They point us to God. But uh, we see partially now, we hope to see face-to-face, um, knowing God directly um, by being joined to him. So grace here and now is the seed of glory. That's a nice little medieval adage uh, St. Thomas loves to use. Grace is the seed of glory. So the life of faith, hope, and charity here on earth, they are the beginning of eternal life. You know, When does our eternal life begin? Is it after we're judged, after purgatory, and we're in heaven finally. It begins in its true fullness there, but the eternal life actually begins with our baptism, you know, our eternal life. That's the first bestowal of faith, hope, and charity we receive. The first were, were made like God. The first were, were divinized. Um, so the, the, the day that we're baptized, you know, is actually more significant, even more significant than the day that we end up dying, you know. Um, death is temporary for, for those who die in Christ, um, right? Um, okay, so faith, hope, and charity refer us to the divine persons. They put us in touch with God, and not only just with God, but with God in himself, in his personal distinctiveness, with the Son, with the Word, with the Spirit, um, with the Father through them both. So um, I just want to kind of conclude by uh, connecting these things and then having just sort of a, a practical word of advice. So I think, you, I think I've mentioned all of these. Um, the one I haven't talked about enough is this, to, to participate in the divine nature. Another way to call it is to be divinized. Not divinization, no wait, not divination, but divinization, uh, to be divinized. To be divinized. In Greek, it's the, so the, the Greek churches, the Greek fathers will call it theosis. Being made God, um, being made divine. Maybe some of you have heard this expression, 
that God became man that men might become gods. That men might become gods, right? And we see that and we're like, okay, that's just a church father exaggerating again, you know? St. Gregory Nazianzus is, is especially uh, attributed to this. Um, this is attributed to him. God became man that men might become gods, right? And we say, oh, well, that's exaggerating, right? We don't want to, you know, like people think we're really weird as Catholics or Christians that we say, well, I'm like a god. First of all, within this is actually already the qualifiers we need, right? God, who's always been God, who is, simply is God, became man, so at a particular point in time, the incarnation occurred. God took on our human nature. Um, that we, through, of course, Christ, through his saving action, through the life of the Holy Spirit, might become gods, right? Become gods. So there's a difference St. Augustine makes between um, being begotten as God. You know, when we say that the Son is begotten of the Father. There's a difference between being begotten God and being made God. Being made God is already something lesser, right? We're not gods just by our nature of itself, you know? We have a, a faint image. Remember, just the lines on their own is that faint image of God. But receiving the life of faith, hope, and charity and coming to dwell with God in heaven uh, and the fullness of that, the fullness of dwelling, we are made gods, you know? Uh, that, that already is kind of qualified, right? Think of how... It's more true that even, even us living in grace on earth, us living on earth, but living the life of grace, this life of sanctifying grace, we are more properly called gods than the pagan gods, right? <laughs> Who didn't even exist at all, right? <laughs> Who didn't even exist. Somebody said, well, that's not counting. They didn't even exist at all. Um, but think about it, you know. Think of how our destiny with God, our eternal destiny with God is greater than that of even than what the pagans thought the life of the gods was like. Because largely their vision of the gods was, um, <laughs> the gods were just like, like people on soap operas, you know, um, you know, like um, kind of aristocrats that got into trouble, you know. <laughs> that was the pagan vision of the gods. What we as Christians claim to be by faith, we know that God is at work in us, making us like himself, making us images of himself, leading us to participate in who he is and to participate in his life. In a way, in a profound, real way, we become gods. It's not just hyperbole. You know, of course, we need to understand it in the right way. So you can always go overboard, right? So I don't want to say that. But I, I would wager that it's much more true than we've ever thought, you know, than, than we ever will um, be able to hold in our minds in this life. Uh, that, you know, for instance, when we see another baptized soul, you know, when we see someone else who has received um, the great gifts of God, that this inner reality is, is there. And uh, we should be respectful of our fellow Christians. And then for those who haven't been baptized yet, or those who haven't met with God's justifying grace, we should see them as potential children of God, right? So everyone is either in this life a, a child of God in the true sense or a potential child of God, you know? So that gives us great, ought to give us great, um, even further respect for the dignity of the human person. Uh, this is everyone's destiny, not just those who were fortunate enough uh, to grow up Catholic, right, or Christian. This is everyone's destiny. Lastly, I'll give you the reason I like to talk about this. Well, maybe like the third or fourth reason I like to talk about this. We're so inclined to judge ourselves by our emotions. I'll say it again. We are inclined to judge our spiritual state by the undulations of our emotions, by the ups and downs. Um, for instance, even the, um, I mean, maybe you've heard the notion of spiritual consolation and desolation, right? That's sensitivity to, to this a little bit. Um, but 
It's important to know all of this about the life of grace because it shows us that God is at work in a level, God is at work in us at a level far deeper than our emotions, right? Um, If I had another instant, I would draw you another picture of the human person and say, uh, well, anyway, maybe you'll provoke me. Someone asked me about that in the Q&A, and then then I'll do that. Um, God is at work in us at a level deeper than our emotions. Think of our souls as a kind of underground cathedral, you know? Um, We're inclined to just take account of what's on the surface, you know, or maybe what's just below the soil, <clears throat> just below the, the grass, our kind of inner psychology. Oh, I'm not feeling like I'm really holy right now. I'm not feeling great. I'm not doing, you know, or I prayed and nothing happened, so maybe I didn't do it right, you know. Um, rather than judging all of that on the surface, we should have confidence in what God does in us through the sacraments. Are we baptized? Okay. Yes. If the answer is yes, great. Proceed. Are we in the state of serious sin? Something we can't look in the mirror and see. It's something we know indirectly by knowing our own history. Okay, have I gone to confession for those serious sins? You know, have I made a good confession since committing those sins? Okay, if I have, and of course with a worthy confession, you know that you're forgiven of all your sins, not just those you happen to remember that day, but all, given that you, you unburdened your conscience all, all together, you've, you've truly been forgiven of all your sins. Okay, that means that you can rely on this, that you are in the state of sanctifying grace, right? And that God is at work in you. And that the only way to decrease in this life is to lose it through serious sin. This is a very consoling thing, that the life of grace in us, though our emotions go up and down like the stock market, sanctifying grace is not really on the same wavelength, right? It's much deeper. It's much much more significant. St. Thomas says that the life of grace... The life of sanctifying grace only increases in us. The only way it can decrease is by being completely lost through serious sin. One image I like to use that comes from Charles Journet in his little book on grace, which is excellent, called The Meaning of Grace. He says that that venial sin, you know, if we're images of God, we're like a mirror, right? Uh, Which God sees his reflection, let's say. Well, venial sin doesn't break the mirror. It covers it over like dust, right? So it becomes a little obscured, but it doesn't harm that fundamental image in terms of breaking it. Mortal sin does, does break that, that image that can, you know, only be restored by God's grace. As hard as it is to fix a mirror, think of how much harder it is to um, convert, to be moved. Uh, well, that's something only God can do. Only God can, can fix our souls, and he's given us a special way, in particular through confession, to fix our souls when we've lost grace through serious sin. So um, this is, I also mentioned slightly as a kind of, um, you know, antidote, you know, not antidote, that makes it sound like it's a bad thing. There are different spiritual traditions talking about different spiritual stages. One obvious one, St. Teresa of Avila has the interior castle with the inner mansions, and there's, there's there concentric mansions that you kind of penetrate deeper and deeper, and she has her own measures for whether you're at a certain level, you know. Um, and, uh, like, if you're still in stage two or three, there's occasionally lizards, you know, and that means, like, distractions in prayer or something like that. I'm not exactly, it's been a while since I read the interior castle. I'm not making fun of St. Teresa of Avila. That's important, and it certainly gives us a great indicator of spiritual progress, like, that can be very helpful. But we shouldn't forget that most fundamentally, there are two states, you know. <laughs> There's the state of mortal sin, and there is the state of grace. And that state of grace has no upper limit to it, you know. Only heaven. Heaven's the limit. The sky's the limit. Um, so it's important for us to remember that. Um, and, and I even have, the, you know, a story of, a, of someone calling up their Dominican spiritual director being, being really concerned I think I'm in the fourth mansion, but I might be in the fifth mansion. I'm not sure if I've reached this stage. And he responds, okay, there are two states. <laughs> There's the state of grace and the state of serious sin. <laughs> uh, and, you know, even those we don't see, like, directly. We have to kind of know indirectly by what we've done. Um, and uh, we should have confidence in that God wants us to be holy. I leave you with that line. That one most dear to Saint, one very dear to St. Catherine of Siena comes again from 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, that God desires us to be holy. God desires us to be holy 
And I spent a lot of time mapping out the sort of anatomy of holiness here, how God makes us holy, how God is at work making us holy. And meditating on this, being confident in God's work, was really St. Elizabeth of the Trinity's uh, bread and butter for her spiritual life. Um, to the point that she even called herself kind of a praise of God's glory. That's why I began with that passage from Ephesians. To be a praise of God's glory. Uh, ultimately, um, you see that it's, it's not just about us, right? God makes us images of himself, and we praise him. And really, there's, there's to be found our eternal destiny. Being happy, giving God praise for all eternity. Um, okay, why don't we take a small break? And then uh, by reading um, and praying together the first paragraph of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity's prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh my God, Trinity whom I adore, help me to become utterly forgetful of myself so that I may establish myself in you as changeless and calm as though my soul were already in eternity. Let nothing disturb my peace, nor draw me forth from you, O my unchanging God. But at every moment may I penetrate more deeply into the depths of your mystery. Give peace to my soul, make it your heaven, your cherished dwelling place, and the place of your repose. Let me never leave you there alone, but keep me there, wholly attentive, wholly alert in my faith, wholly adoring, and fully given up to your creative action. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do people need a break? I don't want to impose a break on you. I'm happy to keep going. Okay. Why don't we do that? We'll just do a couple minutes then. How much longer will you be going? Will I be? If it's three hours. Oh, oh, no, it's, it depends on you, in fact. It depends on your, um, how many questions you have. We just do questions after the break. Oh, okay, good. So. I should explain the, the books, too, that if you want to. This is very good if you want to just read St. Elizabeth's writings herself. Um, she has what are called retreats, which is where on, on retreat every day she wrote small passages and she's really just connecting a lot of things for you and reflecting on them. So it's an easy spiritual reading, very good spiritual reading. Uh, there's also a little bit of biography in, in that edition. This is her letters. If you start getting kind of uh, feel like you've, you, you need more, um, <laughs> uh, it's good. And, you know, I think when you read someone's letters, it's not just knowing the way they would set out a teaching. It's knowing kind of what were their favorite lines, what were their favorite intuition. I'm reading the letters of Catherine of Siena, trying to read one a day. She has a lot, so it's going to be a while. Um, but they're all great, and you, you kind of become more sensitive to what their favorite things are. I think it's a good way to actually get to know a spiritual author is to reading the letters. And then Father Philippon's book is a good one. Um, on the sheet I gave you, too, there's also, I think, reading the Sanctifier, if you're familiar with... Um, the, it's also called True Devotion to the Holy Spirit. That's also a very good place to start. It's a lot of the same things. Um, that's by Archbishop Luis Martinez. Um, yeah, if you want to actually study Trinitarian doctrine um, with Thomas Aquinas, that last book would be good. Um, Father Gilles Emery is kind of like the world expert on Aquinas on the Trinity right now. So, questions? Would someone be my runner? Bryce, do you want to be? Or, yeah, just my, my microphone person. Uh, I will be prompt so that others have a chance to talk. Sure. I thought it was uh, refreshing to hear about Elizabeth of the Trinity in contrast to so often Therese and Therese, uh, Avila. Is that, what's her Therese name? Teresa Avila or Therese yeah, of Lisieux? You know, all those are generally well known mm -hmm, and promoted. Mm -hmm. So, it was, thank you for mm. reflections on the Trinity. Uh, comment I was going to make, or mm -hmm. maybe ask what you mm -hmm. think of it. I'm conscious of um, Augustine's Lord, I believe, or God, I mm -hmm. believe, help my unbelief. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I read recently uh, the comment that the Holy Trinity and all that you have described tonight is both mystery and paradox. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And because of that twofold uh, identification, right. that's, that calls for faith, ultimately, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we believe it can be both. God is God, but he's also man. Mm -hmm. Paradox. Mm. But he's God, and that's mystery. Mm. Yeah. Paradox, not because there's a fundamental contradiction that doesn't resolve in itself, mm -hmm. but from our perspective, we can't, um, we can't know it all. And I, in fact, that's even just within definition of mystery, you know. I think often going through Catholic schools, we're given the impression that mystery means, like, don't ask any more questions, you know. Um, it's a mystery, you know. Like, the priest goes into school, what do you know about the, the Holy Trinity? Father, we can't explain it. It's a mystery. But the definition of mystery is not something we can't know anything about. The definition of mystery is something we can't know everything about. <laughs> so it's that simple. It's a fullness that we can always receive more from. But I would, I would offer that in paradox, mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. a reality that mm -hmm. from our human knowledge, right. Right. it can't be this Defies complete that. understanding. Yeah. Kind of thing. Kind of a simple way of yeah. looking at it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There's, uh, if you know the screw tape letters, there's a funny thing where the one devil's talking to another and he says, you know, the enemy... God, <laughs> um, insists that he's one and three, you know, <laughs> uh, um, yeah. as though it's a kind of um, nefarious campaign, you know, uh, insidious campaign of, of God, but it's, it's who he is. But would you say at the bottom line is faith ultimately is that gift that we have to have? Uh, yeah, that God works in us, you know. Um, this is another both and moment. You say, is faith something that we do or something that God does? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Both. We, we get that. We receive that. Mm -hmm. that we, mm -hmm. we pray for it, but just mm -hmm. don't really know what it is and don't have it. That's right. My point is just knowing that being grafted into the, the church mm -hmm. through the sacraments, living the Christian life, we already have the foundation of this. Of course, we can always grow. You know? But we should be confident what God has already done. So that we know it's not like, oh, maybe I just have no faith some one day, you know. Well, it would take a pretty deliberate act of doubt and rejection to do that, you know. It's not a passing thought in our minds that evicts the Holy Trinity, you know. <laughs> it's a deliberate choice against God, you know. Um, so, but yes, I, I, it's interesting how... Um, I think the only reason St. Elizabeth is more recent. I think we'll see greater devotion and popularity for her. She was only canonized in 2016. So, uh, Where is her home? France. Yeah. France. Yeah. Okay. Dijon, France. So, Other questions? I have a little bit of a rap. Uh -huh. um, and noticing things, so to speak, mm -hmm. that um, uh, in scriptures, there are mentions of the Trinity, some alluded to uh, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in Genesis, we, mm -hmm. the, the plural right. God, we. Let okay. us make man. Yeah. Huh? Pardon me? Let us make man in our. Yeah, our that, that one thing. And then I guess it's uh, the beginning of John where the, the baptism of Christ, is that where it is pretty much? All right, there's where, a manifestation. Where there's a manifestation where you see the Father... The Spirit comes on on Jesus, mm -hmm. the Son, and the Father is is my Son, my Holy Spirit. So, yeah. so you see the, the three of them acting right. in sync, right. Very clearly in, in Scripture. And then there's Jesus at one point, at probably the end of John, where mm -hmm. go ye therefore and baptize the Father, the Son, Holy yep. Spirit. And that's like nailing, that's hitting the nail right on the head. I mean, yep. you, could, you could be more clear about the right. fact that there's something going on right. in, re, in, re, in re reference to a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, but I guess my part one, one question one is, are there other places in Scripture where you, where you see that, um, I don't even want to use the word manifest, clearly pointed out, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And where you see the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit acting in close mm -hmm. sync. Mm -hmm. That's question number one. Well, let me We're, answer just real quick. So sure. Don't forget about it. The, the, the three, there are hints in the Old Testament, of course, but it's only in the coming of Christ that, we were, that God's inner life is made known to us and revealed to us. Uh, the Son has to come before we can learn about how the Father and the Son stand in relation to one another and about the Holy Spirit. But you see hints, you know, even the three visitors to Abraham, um, sometimes you see 
uh, that that icon um, of the three visitors to to Abraham the as, angel, a, as the a angels hint, exactly as yeah. a as a gesture towards uh, foreshadowing of the Holy Trinity, but um, the the passages I mentioned are really where you see those are the those are the four you have Christ who is the visible mission of the Son you know, and the four missions of the Holy Spirit, the tongues of fire at Pentecost, the breath of the Lord, the cloud, and the dove. Um, those are the four that were given. And, um, so it is kind of limited to, the, those are like the chief ones. Now we could talk about hints and foreshadowings in other places, but those would be the chief ones to stay with. Um, a s- second point might be um, when John Paul II, St. Paul II, pa- mm-hmm. became Pope, mm-hmm. Um, I remember, well, not long after that anyway, in The Evangelist, which is the magazine from back in Albany, from where I come, it's the Cat- their Catholic Times, mm-hmm. if you will, uh, how he purported who, ra- who raised Jesus from the dead. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Was the Father? Was the Son? Was the Holy, Sp- or was the Holy Spirit? Who, mm-hmm. you know, did Jesus raise himself? And, and it came down to the point where... Uh, they raised yes. Jesus yeah. from the dead. That one cannot perform without the other. So that kind of like opens a, I will call it a Pandora's box, but mm-hmm. it opens a whole sense of, of explanation yep. of, of like what's going on throughout Scripture. Yep. Uh, You're really onto something there. In no fact, matter where that's you a go. Whole, um, that's sorry. a whole, um, uh, you might say, language that we need to use to talk about the Trinity just uh, well. There's something similar when we talk about Jesus when the Christ, in Christology, um, to be able to talk about his human and divine nature, for instance. Um, in the Trinity, to talk about how uh, God acts in the world, you're right. Anything God does in creation, in salvation, he's doing together uh, as one. It's, it's the divine nature is the principle of, of creation and salvation. At the same time, when God does particular things and makes particular manifestations, he does something that reveals us about his personal distinctiveness, you know, uh, so that, and, and especially by incorporating us in the life of grace, he also, cre- you know, brings about that distinctiveness in us. This is, so, so it's a whole, like, conversation. It's a whole, to talk about appropriation, how the Father, or the Son, or the Holy Spirit get credit for something that really all three of them are doing. But in order to reveal something to us about God and about his inner life, one of the persons is more pronounced or manifest in the action, you know. Um, the, the exception to this is Christ's human nature, right? Only the Son becomes man, right? We can talk about why that, how that exactly works. Um, but that's, a whole, that's the whole conversation of Christology. Um, so that's the one kind of exception, and there's reasons for that, and the reasons it's an easy exception because, um, you know, uh, the human nature of Christ is really related to the Son. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm actually saying something very technical in saying that, <laughs> that I don't want to really go into right now. So, can we go on to another question? Yeah, or? by all means. I can okay. Yeah, thanks for those, because those are two very good places to, to go, to avenues to go further. Okay, I mean, let's say you are, we are inclined to judge our spiritual state mm-hmm. through our emotions, mm-hmm. but God works in us and the life of God works mm-hmm. in us and is deeper than our emotions. Mm-hmm. How do we, when we are stuck in our emotions, mm-hmm. allow ourselves to know that God is working in us because mm-hmm. we tend to forget. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you have any, um, any kind of point Surren- of any answers? I, well, for me, it has to be surrender. Mm-hmm. I have to just surrender those mm-hmm. feelings and not become mm-hmm. caught up in them, yeah. Um, yeah. which is easier said that's than a, done. That's but a great insight. I think something about, certainly the liturgy, we see something objective, you know. We know we've gone to Mass and worship God when we've done that, you know. We can cling to that, you know. But I think also the, the life of devotions and other prayers, sometimes think of, how, think of how calming it actually is, for instance, to pray the rosary, you know. And someone, you know, from the outside might say, oh, you, you pray the rosary because it brings you peace. Like, I do my mindfulness exercises, you know. Um, that's the same thing, you know. It's like, well, I don't pray the rosary merely to bring me peace. I pray the rosary to be in touch with Christ uh, through the 
aid of Mary's contemplation. You know, I, I, that's why I pray the rosary, so that God can act in me, so that I can be in touch with the graces the Savior won for me at moments in his life, certain moments in his life. And saying a repetitious prayer helps to soothe me into that disposition. But it's not just about being soothed. I mean, there are a lot of very secular people against religion who say, oh, it's just all about emotional satisfaction. And there are a lot of religious people who are like, yeah, I'm happy with my emotional satisfaction I get in religion. And here we are as Catholics saying, nope, there's something deeper. You've got to go deeper. Um, and that's why it's very common in spiritual life when someone converts or reverts and comes to a, a new appreciation of the faith. They may have wonderful feelings given them by God for a long, for, for a year or two. And then they may go through a really dry time. You know, it's a, a common word to, to hear spiritual authors talk about spiritual dryness. The trouble then is to not get like absorbed in all of that. Like, yes, it's normal. Sometimes you're going to feel the presence of God very closely and it's going to be wonderful. Sometimes you won't. Do you need to map all that out? The Ignatian tradition would have someone map this out a little bit more in, con in, in connection with their spiritual director. Um, okay, you know, I think that's good, you know, but there's also things where it's like, do not try this at home. You know? <laughs> like, your ups and downs are not actually the most important thing, you know? Um, and the most important thing is, to, is, like you say, to surrender. And uh, I think a lot of the practices we already are so familiar with are answering this very problem. I mean, going to Mass even, listening to the Word of God, um, that's just it, too. The, our, our emotions, they are, well, in us, as human beings, there's an incredibly sophisticated emotional life, you know, and it wants something to, to chew on, you know. It needs an object, right? And that's why we want to give it an eternal object, an object that will last, the Word of God specifically, you know. Uh, think of how just reading the Word of God, um, contemplating the Word of God, is already filling our minds and hearts with something that we can hang on to, that, that reaches down to the inner depth, be, uh, below our emotions, you know, deeper than our emotions, but higher than our emotions, too. You know? um, just to complete my, my little image here, so you have, let's say your emotions are at this level, and you have reason at this level, um, so our mind and, uh, and our will. And, and faith draws us up. Faith is our reason being elevated by God to know what we couldn't know on our own, to know something of him. And our will is drawn up through hope and charity. This is at a level that's not of itself rational, you know, it's not at the level of, of thinking. This is at a level that's not of itself rational. That doesn't mean they're at the same level. <laughs> think of how people, how we're all inclined to think, oh, I have a feeling. When God gives me his graces, it must be a feeling. No, you're right that they're both not in your mind, or, but um, they're not at just the level of what I can reason through, of what I can you know, choose. But that doesn't mean they're at the same level. <laughs> um, this is the way I explain this. This is my way to explain how we get confused, how we get the wires crossed. You know, we think, oh, I have this, um, this sentiment, so it must be up here. No, it's actually lower. You know? um, whereas we should be paying more and more attention to here, even though we have no direct real grasp on how far we are in the spiritual life, or how much faith do I have, Lord? How much love do I have? It's remained, you know, thankfully, mercifully, God doesn't show us where we're at all the time, you know, or else we'd be boasting to one another, you know, or else we would say, well, I'm doing pretty good. No need to try too much harder, you know. Um, mercifully, God gives us the self-knowledge we need, the self-knowledge we can handle at any given time. Um, so he gives it to us in little bits, in other words. Uh, <laughs> So um, that's how I'd explain it. But yeah, it is, it's just a constant. It's part of what it means to, well, just to grow up in general, but also to, to really grow up in the spiritual life is, um, is to, to, even as a matter of faith, have confidence in God's work in us, you know? I guess that's what I meant by surrender. Yeah, and surrender. Sur surrender, and surrender even the, the desire to know exactly where I'm at or 
what my feelings mean exactly because our emotions are largely like unruly children, right? Um, that come and go, that seem to have no... If you've seen Incredibles, uh, the little baby who has all the superpowers um, is, has the most superpowers, but he's also just completely uncontrollable. Uh, and he just does his superpowers all the time. He turns into a raging fireball when he doesn't get his ice cream and, and all of these things. That's kind of like our emotions. And we just sort of learn to manage them, right? Um, um, isn't it funny how we get tied into knots when they say, well, I feel bad, but I don't have a good reason to feel bad. And I feel angry, but I, there's no good reason to feel bad. Well, that's because we don't have a direct rational control over our emotions, but instead a kind of political control, St. Thomas says. It's like we're negotiating, you know? Um, sometimes you just need to eat the ice cream bar. Like, okay, you know, if you gave it up for Lent, don't eat it. But like, if it's the choice between eating the ice cream bar or telling the rest of the world that you hate them, um, just eat the ice cream bar, you know? <laughs> like, um, there, there's, a, there's a hierarchy here, you know? Um, and that's just self-knowledge, right? Coming to know what our limits are and, and, and doing that prayerfully, and, you know? We've all got limits, so, you know? I, th I think I saw your hand a little while ago, yeah. Thank you. Father, I was just going to ask what you suggested that we ask, if you could elaborate a little bit more on that other image. I think it was related to... Oh, I the, think it was this. Was that the, yeah, was that the same I think one? it was this. Okay. Um, yeah. Another way to think of it is, um, here's, here's the human person. What's the two big parts of us? <laughs> you might think like, uh, I don't know, my head and my torso? You know, no, body and soul, right? Mm -hmm. So body and soul. What was that? No. <laughs> so what are our two faculties, our two spiritual faculties, are our intellect and our will, right? We're the only creature with this kind of thing, right? We're the only creature that God has made that belongs to both the visible and the invisible realms in the same creature, right? God has summarized creation. And so St. Thomas calls this a kind of horizon of creation, right? That heaven and earth meet in us. Um, and so because we're embodied creatures, we also have an emotional life uh, with feelings. Um, we also have, you know, some very basic things. We share things in common with plants. We grow, we eat, we reproduce. That's like part of what it means to be an embodied creature. Um, so... Uh, things we share, so uh, just like life and growth. Um, and then also we can sense. Uh, we have our five senses. Our emotional life is, is also a lot having to do with our internal senses. And I want to point out two that are especially important in the spiritual life, and that's our imagination and our memory. Okay, our imagination and our memory. Think of how these are at play in our spiritual lives. Mm -hmm. you know, how do I know if I've forgiven someone? You know, this, is, this comes up a lot, right? Uh, I still have a sore memory about what they did to me. When I think about it, I start to get angry. Have I truly forgiven them? Well, in fact, you, you probably have. I mean, if, if you've decided to forgive them, uh, forgiveness is at the level of a choice. You're, you're surrendering. You're saying, I forgive this person. God help me to. But there may still be wounds in your memory that kind of occasionally creep up into your imagination. You start replaying the tape, you know. You try to put that to peace, you know, to surrender. It's not a good exercise, right, um, to just simply replay over and over again the things that people have done to us that we didn't like. What's important is to renew when, those things, when that comes to mind, to renew our choice to forgive someone, you know. Um, and to be confident in God's work in us, you know? Um, so that's just helpful, to, helpful to, to parse. And so just so you know, this is like different. It's kind of the same thing. But faith is here and hope and charity would be here um, as the perfections brought to those. Um, yeah. So that's what... Um, and I think since we're getting towards the end, I'm happy to answer your question afterwards, but um, if there's no other person with a question... We can pray a prayer. I don't want to cut you off if you have a question. Great. Okay, let's say the, um, 
the very last stanza of, of that Elizabeth of the Trinity prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O my three, my all, my beatitude, infinite solitude, immensity in which I lose myself, I surrender myself to you as your prey. Immerse yourself in me so that I may be immersed in you until I go to contemplate in your light the abyss of your splendor. May the peace and blessing of Almighty God through the intercession of St. Thomas and St. Elizabeth descend upon you. He who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Great. Thanks for coming out. We have a, a, a series coming up for Lent. So the next Into the Deep will actually be part of the Lenten series. Uh, and that'll take the place of Into the Deep until May. Um, we'll have in March and, uh, and April. The, on pretty much every Thursday of Lent. Um, that's so. Stay tuned. More to come. I have one of them. The other